right. We can start here. Call our meeting to order. Zoom meeting number three, I think it is, April 22nd, 2020, our select board meeting. Um, can hit the consent agenda first. We have our payroll and vendor warrants, PR2020, PR2021, AP2037, AP2037S, AP2038, AP2038-2, AP2038S, AP2039, AP2039S, AP2040, and AP2040S. We have April 15th, 2020. And then we have a pollinator resolution uh, select board vote, which I may pull out. I don't know if John or uh, David yeah. are here. They were going to say something about it. So let's yes, just set that you. aside now, and then we can, after we vote on the consent agenda, you can say something about that, okay? I, I would like you to pull it out also. Anything else you want us to pull out, Joyce, or just that? No, nope, just that. I'll make a motion to accept all other warrants and uh, minutes from um, April 15th. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And then, John, if you want to say something regarding the pollinator resolution? Yeah, hi. Uh, I think it was a different John. John Root. John. Yes, I'm here, John yeah. Root. Yeah, 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 yes, there you are. So, uh, did you all receive the, a copy of the resolution? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, so, uh, as, as perhaps you're aware, it's a non-binding resolution. It does not commit the town of Hadley to do anything in, in the way of actions or expenditures or the like. Uh, but uh, I'm a member of Western Mass Pollinator Networks. We're asking every municipality in the, in the Western Massachusetts to take this step to commit. Uh, in other words, do whatever you can to uh, limit the use of pesticide, uh, pesticides and herbicides on town owned land uh, as much as possible and maximize the establishment of pollinator habitat on town owned land. Uh, I have met with the Conservation Commission. They're quite excited about starting something uh, on the tract of land uh, North Lane along, along the river. Uh, our, our idea is to at least uh, begin by stopping mowing and see what comes up. But we might do a lot of other things there as test, uh, test plots to show uh, residents uh, what can be done. Well, there are a lot of options in terms of establishing pollinator habitat. Uh, there are different degrees that one can uh, go about this. Great Barrington, I would say, is the poster child. Not only have they passed the resolution, but they uh, uh, devoted considerable uh, resources to uh, planning uh, a pollinator pathway is what they call it, uh, and then uh, and then making it happen. And that was with uh, help from Conway School of Landscape Design and some uh, professional uh, uh, consultants. And so it's a uh, pollinator pathway idea, as you can imagine, this, the idea of connectivity really helps for uh, these, especially the wild bees, and they're the most important pollinators, uh, to have contiguous plots of land where they can do their foraging. Uh, so, uh, I'm not expecting that level of commitment from Hadley, at, le at least not right now, but uh, I think that we can begin to do some things and there's some things that, that could be done that would cost very little or nothing at all, just in the way of getting the word out. Uh, and we'll be especially involving uh, Hadley uh, residents uh, to uh, in, in a, perhaps an informal uh, friends of Hall uh, friends of uh, uh, bees in Hadley, that's, that sort of thing, uh, to, uh, uh, to perhaps uh, mailers could go out, uh, you know, when you do that town mailing for other purposes, there could be something included about uh, educating people about how they can uh, improve their uh, pollinator habitat. One of the simplest things is to stop mowing so often. And if you set your uh, mower at say three or four inches and then wait every two or three weeks, it's amazing how many lawn flowers you will uh, allow to bloom, clover, violets, thyme, uh, some little mints and that sort of thing. And surprisingly, uh, in Springfield, when they did this, 111 different species of native bees showed up. So that's really important. 
Uh, and of course, if we if you have a perfect green lawn, then that's a food desert. Um, and so we're trying to be, because we have so much lawn, and because that's such a big part of the uh, the crisis that we're in in terms of plummeting numbers of uh, insects and birds. And of course, that's part of the problem too, is that the that lack of habitat in both cases is is uh, causing these steep declines. And we can't afford uh, to to lose our nature, uh, our uh, uh, our uh, you know it's it's the uh, we're we're talking about the really the, the fundamental the foundation of our environment here. So, uh, and everyone knows that we depend on pollinators to eat. Uh, they pollinate their foods, but they also have important roles to play in the environment as a whole. Uh, so uh, that's I guess a good introduction to the topic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for presenting that to us. Um, I don't know if we want to motion to to draft this uh, resolution tonight, but maybe think, it's something we could take under advisement and talk with the DPW director about and kind of. Well, I think we need. I certainly think we need to take it under advisement. There mm -hmm. was a lot of things in that proclamation that uh, affect uh, residents of Hadley. Those that do. You uh, use true true green or something to that effect. I see that happening. A lot of people use Omasta landscaping uh, for their lawns. Um, you also have um, they're talking about no mowing on the dike. Uh, what does that do uh, for the dike itself and uh, pr causing any problems there or not? If we don't take care of it, um, you also have if you don't do mowing, you also have a lot of. Uh, Farmers that uh, have, are growing uh, vegetables and plants and um, corn and things along, down on Cemetery Road uh, that is in, in proximity to the dike itself. Um, and you're asking them to um, retain or not, not work or do so well with their uh, the pesticides that they use. Um, I think this is going to take a little bit more than a, us passing a proclamation tonight. I think we need a little bit more input from um, a lot of people before we do this. Yeah, and just, John, have you thought about bringing this maybe to town meeting? I don't know if that, that's a good venue for it or not, but I saw that being a possibility too. I'd certainly be happy to do that. Uh, I'm not a Hadley resident, but uh, David Moskin uh, is the one who is the stand-in, I guess, of the okay, Hadley. Yeah. The, the nominal Hadley the representative uh, to, um, uh, I, I'd uh, like to have a chance to respond to some of those uh, questions that were just brought up. Uh, the most important one being that it's a non-binding resolution. So uh, no, no it farmer. It, it doesn't matter, John. This is something that um, I think needs further discussion, whether it's non-binding or not. It's something that uh, can, be, can be put into a proclamation. When you do a proclamation, you're basically saying that you agree with it, and I, you know, at that at this point, without uh, having some input from other people, I think it's important that we. It's not okay. that I, I support the bees. I love honey. Mm -hmm. uh, I get honey from uh, Ray Russell up in North Hadley. He's got a great right. bunch of bees up there. Um, you know, so it's not that I'm against any of this, but I think we need to have a little bit more input from other people. Yeah. Sure. So David uh, Moskin, do you want to kind of take that under advisement and see see what we want to take for next step with this? Uh, sure. This is all about supporting growers. It's not about honey. Uh, maybe you guys could think about who, who you'd like the feedback from between now and town meeting, and we can see if there is any negativity from the grower population. Yeah, uh, that would be of concern. I think reaching out maybe like to the agricultural commission and the you know sure. DPW director, kind of those types of things. Sure. So involving them, see what, yeah. see what their buy-in is or something like this. No, I think Joyce's statements are fair. Let's get some more input on this. I, I think it makes sense. Uh, what I see going on with other towns and my family is involved with this up in Alaska to support growers up there. Um, it's all about the farming community and trying to keep good pollination out there. Uh, <clears throat> we want to keep that barley coming in too, you know. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'll, gather, okay. um, I'll gather some local input. And uh, Joyce, please feel free to contact me if you have people who would like to respond. I don't, you know, I don't know who. Um, who I the just best saw. To talk to. I DPW. Just, yeah. Yeah, I just saw it today, David. So um, I'm a little bit behind the eight ball here and seeing the proclamation. So um, I certainly would like to, you know, I'll reach out to people and see what they think about it, and I'll Good. be prepared to 
you know, give you a little bit more input the next meeting. Good. That's fair, fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thanks, John, for presenting hey, to us. Hey, hang on, Christian. Yeah. Oh, John. Yeah. Uh, listen, we spent about 30 years, and I don't know how many thousands and thousands of dollars maintaining that dike. And we're barely keeping up with it right now mm -hmm. with the woodchucks and stuff like that. And I think you're just looking at a multi million dollar failure of that dike, and nobody's here to fund it and help us with it. Could, could I ask a question? Could, uh, uh, as far as that uh, tract of land there, we're not proposing that we completely let it go. Uh, it would be uh, it would be mowed once a year in the spring. So no, that's not. Yeah, I don't want to get too deep into this specific right, right now. So let's just right. take it offline, and then you know we we have issues okay. here we could discuss for a while. So let's, thank you, uh, Christian. Let's that's take smart. those and and take them for another time. But thank yeah. you. Okay, thanks, Christian. Yep, thanks, guys. All right, I'm gonna open it up here real quick for public comment. Uh, as in previous weeks, this can be tricky, but if anybody has a public comment they'd like to make at this point, I would uh, urge you to turn on your camera and wave your hand so that Jennifer can unmute you and then you can make your public comments. Uh, you could also chat us in the chat window if you would like to say something, we can unmute your microphone. I'm just gonna wait two minutes here or a minute while and see if anybody pops up. It doesn't look like it. Is Tom uh, Waskevich on there by chance? Who? Tom Waskevich. No. No, he was gonna try and zoom in on the meeting tonight for, I asked him to do that at public con comment. Could I make his comment then right now? Would that be a good time? Sure, Joyce. Yeah, it's public comment, so go ahead. But you only have three minutes, and we're going to move. Uh, well, I'm not going to take but three minutes. Tom uh, has introduced this idea of uh, making a sign of uh, and bringing back that Hadley is the uh, world uh, growing place of asparagus. So he has this idea. He likes to run it across. Um, on us and would like us to support him as a board that we are um, number one in the world for actually for asparagus as we used to be. Uh, he has uh, um, researched this himself and uh, he has, so I'm going to have to have him, uh, maybe he'll zoom in at another point on this program, but uh, he would like to bring that to the forefront and uh, it certainly would be better news than some of the other news that we're doing right now. So it would kind of be fun that we used to be uh, the capital of the world for uh, growing asparagus. And, and they, like I said, he has researched it. So if we could, uh, you know, entertain that thought at some point, that would be great. I'd like to like us to do that. Yeah, I, I think he said that last week, Joyce. Was he around last week for a public comment? Or I feel like I've heard this. So um, he, he, I think he sent out a notice or, or something to us yeah, yeah. an email um, it rings a bell but i guess he wanted to go ahead i think he spoke to david about it david uh uh nixon uh, but i think, I think he, he was, emailed everyone yeah he emailed everyone okay. so i don't know um what everybody's thoughts are on that but i'll have tom uh maybe bring it forward on on another meeting that we could look into maybe our next meeting yeah, and I was going to say, again, the Agricultural Commission was thinking of putting up that sign. Remember, they wanted to yeah. put up the right to farm community sign. Maybe there's something yeah. with that sign and asparagus that they could do, and that would be a nice thing. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, okay, I'll tell Tom we talked about it, and maybe I can get him to Zoom the next time. Okay. And then, thank you. Uh, yep, thank you. And then real quick, uh, I know there's a lot of people on the library that are waiting to talk about the library, but I was just gonna go to our new business real quick, which is the select board reorganization. Um, you know, this year the town election is deferred until May 16th. However, typically at this meeting, actually the last meeting um, is when the select board elects a new chair and a clerk. I don't know, I am open to us doing that tonight for this meeting or also open to us waiting until the first meeting after the May 16th election to hold that um, reorganization. So whatever the board kind of wants to do, 
I think we have two options there and I'm open to either one. I just don't know if we wanna change the reorganization with a new member coming on the select board or with, without their um, involvement or if we wanna um, make the change now when we typically would. So I don't know if anybody has any comments about that. I, I think it would be okay to, to, to do it at this point. Um... Molly, unfortunately, you're not going to be with us for very long, but we're going to keep you very active and busy, um, as, as you said you would. Um, and I'd like to I'd like to nominate David Phil. Uh, he stepped back out when I was chair two years ago, and uh, he didn't run last year. And um, I know sometimes how uh, trying and hard it is um, to be. Uh, the chairman, there's a lot of work that's being done and, and Christian, you've done a tremendous job this year in uh, holding things together because we've had a lot of um, things that we've had to have on our plates this year and you really directed everybody uh, in a very good pattern, but sometimes um, just taking a little break but still being a participant is always a good thing and just let somebody else try to run it as well. You set the pace for what we have to do for the coming year um, and take a break yourself because it is very time consuming. You've been on so many committees and everything else uh, this past year. I really appreciated all that you've done. Um, so let's give David a little more work this year and let him uh, <laughs> let him take it for the year and, and see where we go. Um, so I'll make that motion to, to uh, uh, have David be chair for this next coming year. Yeah. If we do it right now and a new member comes on board and wants to take a vote on it, we can do it later after the election also. So if something needs to be overturned. Yeah, we could. <clears throat> yeah, that, like I said, I'm happy to hand over the reins. As Joyce has said, it's a lot of work, so I'm happy to hand it off to David or someone. Um, but I'm happy to hold off another month, too, if, if that's what we need to do. So our, our re-vote then. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll second Joyce's motion. And um, I also want to reiterate what Joyce said. Um, I think Christian's done a fantastic job as chair. And I think that David Phil is underworked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a little hiatus from his job. <laughs> um, you know, and as John said, I mean, and I can't imagine any candidate coming on, you know, Anybody who gets elected is not likely going to be, you know, lobbying to be the chair right away. So um, mm -hmm. I would think that it's perfectly fine to <clears throat> transition now. Okay, well, sounds good. Um, I just asked that after this, we move to uh, the library conversations because I know uh, somebody else has another meeting we have to get to. So that's my only request, but all those in favor. Aye. 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 I'll make a All motion. Right. Uh, Christian, how would you like to be clerk alongside of David? And oh, that's just, fine. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I'll make a, I'll make a motion for Christian to be clerk for this next coming year. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh that's in favor. <laughs> Who takes over? Joyce does. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Is David the chair yet? It's his turn. <laughs> I'm second. used to being in charge. For God. <laughs> We've got a motion in so, a second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank I you think very Tommy, much. I think Tommy Waskevich just beeped in there. I don't know if. I think he did. Oh. Aye, Tommy. Can, he can you hold off until we do the library? <laughs> what's that, what's that? Getting set up here. What's happening? Yeah. Yeah, we need to wait because uh, Mark Sullivan's going to have to drop off. All right. Can what's, you hang uh, on? Can you ask Tom to hang on till after yep, Mark? I am. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear. Oh, you. where where are you? Up in a plane? <laughs> That's good old UMass behind me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. <coughs> Great. All right, we're gonna move on to the library for now, and then we'll come back to Tom right after that's done. So, David Nixon, what do you have for us for the library? All right, so uh, right now uh, we have a, a contractor who's run out of work or close to, is looking to continue the job. I uh, had a conversation with me and I said that I would talk to Mark Sullivan, the OPM, which we managed to do a couple minutes before the meeting started. Um, 
we have i have not seen all the documentation that has gone back and forth between the massachusetts board of library commissioners and the governor's office um the essential question however is whether the library is considered to be essential construction or not if it is considered to be essential construction we should continue if not then we should wrap it up as quickly as we may and put it on ice until such time as the the restrictions are lifted um if you don't mind me my opinion um i have argued for a long time that the library is actually an essential part of the community uh and that this construction is uh essential because of the function it serves um as well as the fact that it's joined at the hip with the senior center which everybody agrees is also an essential function okay I have, can, can, can mark tell us um if it was put on hold which i'm not in favor of by any means shape or form uh because we need to have access through there i believe there was some underground work that needed to be done uh and with the senior center um coming to an end more or less in the building process um going through that lot there uh mark how close is it to getting that stuff done um underground that you need to get done there by the library it, it's it's not close enough uh to be honest and if i can a little backstory for everyone so, so when the the covid 19 issue hit uh maybe six weeks ago um and the governor's directive came out uh that unless it's essential uh, construction everything should should stop uh the the question was asked to the town is is the library considered essential and the answer was yes so they kept going but then two three weeks after that the mblc asked for a clarification from the governor's office specific to public library construction was that deemed essential and the response was no so mblc came back uh to us and because of their uh, main funding, the main funding source uh, for the project, and we didn't want to mess any of that up, uh, they said wrap it up and shut the project down. We were hesitant to do that because the, the project at that time was maybe 80% done as far as the building envelope was concerned. The roof was was almost done, but not quite. The, the shell of the building was almost done, but not quite. So we asked MBLC, can we finish this? It's not at a good point to leave. And their response was yes, wrap it up as soon as you can, and then you're done. And we're maybe 10 days away from doing that. In the meantime, talking to um, the contractor and, and, and Joyce, what you mentioned, so we're, we're restricted to doing only the, the shell of the building, can't work inside, and can't do any additional work outside. The additional work outside, the underground utilities, that we don't have permanent electric yet to the building, um, and the utilities that are going to be underneath this shared group to the senior center um, has not been completed yet. So I would advocate strongly uh, that the town should ask for a reconsideration of the governor's office um, for a few reasons that the, this, uh, they, they know certainly the MBLC knows of the unique nature of the shared site with, between the library and the senior center. And so I think a, certainly a, a strong argument could be made that this project is essential. And at the very least, the underground site work around the library is essential because it's tied, as David said, to the hip, to the senior center. Um, and the hope would be that we could continue not only outside, but back inside as well, because it's unfortunate when everything shut down on the inside, the contractor was really in a nice rhythm um, and they were, uh, they were progressing quickly on the inside. And it was almost just as soon as they found that rhythm, we had to shut them down, which was unfortunate. Uh -huh. I just wanted to add too that I have been emailing with the chief of staff of Senator Comerford's office, explaining how they gave us guidance that the governor said, or they gave us guidance that the towns can say what's essential and non-essential. The governor has said in media interviews that he wants to keep construction going and we're getting conflicting information from the MBLC that they sh are telling us to shut down. Unfortunately, I emailed with the chief of staff this morning 
hoping we would have something and we don't have anything yet out of the governor's office um, giving us kind of a verdict on this. So um, it's, it's I don't an know. Odd it's an odd situation because initially the, the, the governor's office defers to local authority. Had a very clear direction. A local authority said this project is essential. Keep going. But then the MBLC has gotten in between the governor's office and Hadley and said, no, you're, it's not essential. And so there's a hesitancy to move forward. So we don't want to lose part or all of the funding or just get in the way or, or, or cause any issues with the funding source. Um, so we need, I guess, clarification of uh, who, who trumps who. Does the town trump MBLC? Does the governor's office trump the town? How does it all work? But I would certainly advocate that you could you could petition the governor's office and say, we understand the position, but this is a unique project and we think it's essential that the work continues. Mark, can I ask a question on the financial end of it? If you are your uh, um, architects or your whoever's doing the project there for you, is this going to be a money problem for the town of Hadley that we could also say that it could cause us a hardship by... Uh, stopping the process after they've given you just about 10 days to finish up the outside. Um, is this going to make a difference in the allocation of money at all? Certainly there's an exposure there and Phil O'Brien's with us, the architect, and, and, and he can speak to it as well. Um, you, because again, of the unique situation where you've got the senior center and uh, the library shared uh, with the shared site, you could have expo exposure on two fronts. One is if the library gets extended by a month or six or eight weeks, then you've got additional general conditions by the, um, the contractor to carry that cost for another month or two. And then with the senior center, you could have exposure because if they don't have access through the library, because the library can't give them that access, there um. may be additional costs incurred, uh, whether it's traffic control or something um, on the on the senior center side. So um, there is an exposure there. I'm, I'm not really sure why, I guess, the select board wasn't asked about the, the feelings for the project and reaching out to the governor's office and MBC and whoever else when it's, I guess, one of, one of our building projects. Um, I, I do feel that the project does need to continue. There's a lot going on. Um, you know, we've got senior center. Uh, there, there, we need that access absolutely from Middle Street when the senior center opens. We can't have seniors trying to get out onto Route Nine. Uh, you know, by the by the Legion there. So yeah. um, I do an essential project. project. Uh, I'm certainly not going to hold it against any certain contractor if, if he or she decides that you know, they don't feel comfortable working on the site because of you know, COVID-19 or something like that. Um, but I think that if any contractors want to work, we should allow them to work and let the project move on. So, yeah. David, um, I just wanted to say that the they went on behalf of all their building projects, not just Hadley. That's why I think we might have a chance because their ruling was about all of their building projects. It wasn't specific to Hadley. Right. So I think that's where we may have a, you know, a place to stand on, that we're unique. Yeah, so, I mean, if we can petition, I, I don't know that we should petition the MBLC. I think the governor's office trumps them. So I think we should right. ask the governor's office, make the case for the senior center, the library, uh, everything involved and, and go that direction versus the MBLC. I, I, I think agree. that was the idea. Yeah, the MBLC's taken their lead from the governor's office. When they reached out to them for a clarification, they were given this blanket statement that, you know, all public library construction is not essential. Um, but if there are specific cases, then those specific cases have to raise their hand and advocate on behalf of themselves. And I think that's the position the town is in. I mean, I'm still waiting for a response from the senator's office there, which will be a response from the governor's office kind of clarifying this contradiction so i don't know how much time we have but if we can wait um a few more days and see what we well get back he's, he's, that. mark you're only looking at 10 days to finish the underground work and get a like a base code down around the library no, it, was, it was 10 days to finish the building envelope so the 
the walls, the vapor barrier, the roof, the shingles on the roof. So the building would be weather tight so that if they had to shut it down for an extended yeah. period of time, the building would be secure. But the underground that I spoke of hasn't, it hasn't really started to any extent. How long, how much uh, underground you got before you can put the base coat down? They've got, they've got several Months? weeks. Yeah. Several weeks. They, they had suggested to us that it was something on the order of four to six weeks was their estimate. Uh, Mark, is there anything, and well, maybe the, the library building committee would know this better. Is there anything in the language for, for the, the grant money from the MBLC that would, where the money would be put at risk if we chose to proceed with the project, like the governor's office seems to allow versus their order that says that it's not essential. Is there anything, any legal language in, in that grant document that would put our money at risk? Not specifically, but I think only because this is such a unique situation, nobody's, there's, there's no plan book for the situation that we're in. And so there's confusion and conflicting information from different sides. And I think MBLC is trying to, do what they think is best, uh, which, I, which I get. Uh, and the, the contractor today at our weekly job meeting was advocating, can't we just sneak in? Who's going to tell? MBLC is not going to be policing this project. Just give, let me have half a dozen people. We'll keep, keep our social distance. We can keep working inside. And I certainly empathize with them. But I think there's a hesitancy <clears throat> on, on the library's part that you know MBLC, who's funding half the project, has told us, to stop. And so we don't want to purposely go against that. Uh, yeah. and I mean, sign I'm, off on that. Until, <laughs> until we get a decision from the state, you're going to, you, you do have all the personal protection for all the contractors there right now. So we can keep on moving forward. We do. And, and Christian or David said there, there may be a case where a contractor is allowed to go on site, but maybe they have personnel that are, uh, Maybe instead of having six people, they only have three people because three have uh, concerns about coming onto the site. That's a different different matter. But they've got all the, the the protection and the sanitization stations, and they're doing all all that they can to keep the project safe. So I don't have an issue with respect to the COVID nineteen protocols. So does anybody on the library building committee or the trustees that are here have an issue with? Um, us continuing with the construction and in the meantime, uh, petitioning the governor. And then if the governor says, Hey, you got to shut it down, then obviously he's got the final say on it. And then we shut it down. Hey. Um, David, we've talked about this as a committee and I think we feel, you know, it's your decision to make, not, not ours. We just want the right decision. And that's why I came to your meeting last week a little bit and was, probing, I, I, I'm sorry if I made anyone feel uncomfortable. We were trying to figure that out ourselves. Like, would we be liable if this shut down for money? Like all those things concern us too. So, I, I mean, I would like to speak. I think the trustees are all in agreement. We just want to be in agreement with the board and work together. Okay. Yeah, our only and we want to make sure we're safe. Was, we want, right. Yeah, safety. And not losing our grant. So we just didn't want to put the grant at jeopardy because that would not be good for the town. Who 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 uh, who contacted the uh, Massachusetts Library? Joyce, they they actually so that's what I'm trying to say. They made an they contacted all the buildings that are being built, so uh -huh. they actually went to the state and then contacted every library that has their grant. It's not just a Hadley thing; it's for every library that has their grant. They didn't say, Hadley, you have to shut down. They right. said anyone with an MBLC grant has to shut down. Okay. That's why so we I, think we might have an in to say yeah. not everybody's building in front of a senior center that's building also, you know? Right. I, I would like to make a motion to um, uh, petition the governor's office uh, to allow us to continue this project uh, for the good of the town and for the good of the senior center being that it's a complex uh, situation that's going on there, uh, I think that, and Mark, I want to ask you, uh, why haven't we started before now to get that underground utilities in there before, uh, before this time has elapsed already? Well, to be honest, it was, it was more of a timing issue with 
if you, you can't be working on the outside of the building and doing the site, it's a tight site and doing the underground around the building at the same time. So they want to get off the exterior, make it weather tight, then back off and then do the site work. Um, okay. And so, you know, we for the, the project was shut down for two weeks straight out because uh, there was a concern that one of the roofers had tested positive. Correct. And then after that, they jumped back in but then we pull them out and now they're outside only. And so we've lost, we've, you know, lost probably three to four weeks anyway, yeah. just because of that. Yeah. Okay. So other than that, you would have already done running the electric to that building or not? Is I don't that know if it'd be done, but it'd be underway and it hasn't, under and it hasn't started yet. So, um, as, as we discuss this, I would like at the end of the night, uh, clarification, if there's a, if there's a motion to, to keep going, uh, which I'm certainly advocating for. I just want clarity. Is it is because right now we're working on the building envelope only, and and the hope is that May 4th, you know, the uh, the governor's office is uh, right now. May 4th is the date where people are hoping kind of the veil is lifted, and the hope was that there wouldn't be a lot of downtime, and and after uh, they're done wrapping the building on May 4th, they could go back inside. Mm -hmm. And I want to find out tonight are we are we saying that they can go back inside immediately or can they start the underground immediately and just get clarification so that we can relay the right information to the contractor mm -hmm. Molly, did you have something well i made i made a motion yeah i made a motion do you want to anybody want to second that yeah that's why i was just seconding your motion for the petition portion thank you thank yeah. you i just want to say i'm I want to say too, I'm already petitioning the governor's office as much as I can to get clarification on this. You know, I'm working with Senator Comerford and Dan Carey to try to get an answer out of the governor's office. I don't know, unless David Nixon has some magic strings he can pull, I don't know how else we can get a hold of the governor's office right now. All right. Thank you, Christian. I, I just want to yeah. at least get this in place uh, to petition uh, while we are waiting on them to respond to us just so that we have something that we're going to move forward on also within the next week was my rationale to uh, making this motion. Uh, thank you for petitioning them already, but we haven't heard from them. But if we at least can uh, get something out of our uh, select board meeting tonight in, in, you know, getting us to want to move forward in petitioning the governor also um, certainly doesn't help in their help alongside of, if Joe Comerford and uh, Dan Carey can help us, and I will call Dan Carey tomorrow. I got his number, so um, I will also call him myself tomorrow or tonight, maybe. So I, um, you know, if if this motion passes, I, I would like to talk about kind of opening the floodgates for you, Mark, and uh, you know, telling any contractors that want to get in there in the in the meantime, you know, hit it hard and and get as much as you can done. And like I said, if the governor comes back and says no, then that was the answer. Okay. Let's, I mean, let's vote on this, and then if, let's yeah. vote on this, and I'm going to give you another motion, David. After this one, <laughs> okay. so we have a motion in the second. Uh, all in favor of petitioning the governor's office to continue construction. Aye. 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 All right. My next motion, David, Aye. is to, is to uh, uh, have the contractor continue with the work over there um, until we hear differently. I want them to continue. So that's my motion to continue with the project. Uh, Until we get official me. notification. Correct. And uh, again, mm -hmm. using uh, proper technique, uh, whatever they need to do to maintain uh, uh, COVID uh, precautions, that would be great as long as they're inside the building, maintaining those precautions. Uh, I'm all in favor of that. Can I offer a friendly amendment that we, we, make the motion saying that they will continue with the full scope of the, the library project work, just so that way we're clear telling them they can work on anything and everything. Thank that you. Second, whatever, yeah. yes. I'll second that. All right. Yeah, I would just maybe say in there too, uh, just we deem it an essential project basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Christian, that's true. All right, motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Super. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark. Anybody else uh, from the library want to give any updates on uh, what's going on? David, um, 
We need to do change orders, but before we do that, I just want to say one other thing about us going forward. Um, I'm wondering if it would help too if the MBLC heard about like our how we're keeping people safe. Like maybe we could make a statement from the Board of Health. Like just I'm just saying to build allies with them. Um, like some plan from the Board of Health, just in case they give us a problem. I'm I'm totally in favor of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then Allison's going to take us through change orders. Okay. I, I think we ought to not do anything other than uh, not adding to the, the the Massachusetts library there. I think that we should uh, just do what we're doing right now without opening up any other can of worms. Uh, not saying, I, I think that going forward, I think in getting the petition out there and saying that the project is essential uh, to the governor's office, uh, who will overrule on uh, the Massachusetts library, um, and also uh, getting some help from Comerford and and Carrie. So I don't I don't think we should open up that can of worms of uh, going back into the M the Massachusetts library and telling them what we're doing because we're we're just continuing on whether you like it or not. So let's not do that. <laughs> Right, but they did give us three million dollars, right? So we want to be prepared right. in case they say something. I'm yeah. not saying like just run out and give it to them. I'm saying have it prepared yeah. so we know we're ready to go. Mark, do you have a written um, plan for COVID nineteen precautions, anything like that for the site? The con the contractor is is following all the protocols. They had a shutdown day. They've had they've got. Uh, a written plan. So they have a written safety plan and basically a COVID-19 amendment to that safety plan. So I wouldn't want to get in the position where we're having the MBLC review of the safety plan. Um, Correct. But, and so our, with our oversight, we have a clerk on the, on the project uh, every day. So he's, and it's, it's a come up before when people were trying to figure this whole thing out where we raised our hand and said, you're not following the governor's uh, protocols. And so they, they've since ramped it up. And we have a third party safety inspector who's who's come by and signed off on what they're doing. So, um, oh, okay. so I think I feel comfortable with with that. The precautions are being met. I, I see them putting their masks on every morning on my way to work. I see these guys going in there and they're putting their masks on. So um, I'm very happy with that. And if they're maintaining some distance as best as they can, I, I think that's a real plus over there. Yep. So we have a written plan, though. So if they come back to us and ask us for what we're Correct. doing, we can say that we have third party verification. We've got a written plan. Uh, I think even Board of Health was going to review it or did review it. So uh, I think we're pretty covered there. Yep. But, yeah. you, you have a, a safety officer on the site, Mark? We have a third party um, independent uh, safety uh, consultant okay. that comes by every 10 days, two weeks to do a, a okay. audit of the of the project. And, and you got your protocols anyway that you started with, just right. the, the CDC exactly. recommendations are more. Uh, has OSHA stopped down on that project yet? I want to say they were there early. The OSHA was up and down Route 9 uh, earlier in the project, and I don't think they've been back uh, since okay. then. Good. There's yeah. a motion on the table, David. No. No, we already voted. We already, we already voted for full scope of uh, continue with the work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're good. And David, Phil, before um, Allison walks us through all the change orders, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make sure that Allison knows um, the only thing that is in board docs, Allison, is the Excel spreadsheet that lists change orders one through whatever. Um, and then there's a column that says recommended on all of them except for the first one. So the, the material makes it look like the um, all of those are being recommended and i know that's not the case so i think that was recommended perhaps by the by the architect or somebody but just so you know what we're looking at okay yeah that's what i sent along so yes okay if you guys are ready and have that document i'll just use that document to, to walk through i'm yeah. also going to be calling on in addition to mark who you've met who's our opm we have uh phil o'brien who's our architect um and we've specifically asked them to come here so that they can just better explain one of the change orders so that we can be as efficient as possible and not delay things any further 
so when you're looking at this document, um, I'm just not going to look at number one because number one was rejected by our OPM and architects because that work should have already been included. So that's not coming through as a change order. So we have two through seven. Uh, three of these are basically things that need to happen in order for the construction to continue. Those are numbers four, five, and six. The other three are sort of value added that were brought um, either by the library director, the um, building committee, somebody. Um, what we really want to focus on here is number four the bay window modifications uh, for the children's room. The trustees uh, voted to accept um, five and six, which are the other must haves, and they voted to accept uh, number seven, which will give us electronic access to our after hours meeting room as a value added. But we did not, we voted not to accept uh, two, which is the uh, a change in flooring for the meeting room. We just decided not to uh, to spend that money right now. And we have not yet voted on number three because we just aren't at a point where we have to. So we don't want to even consider it at this point with the uncertainty with the, with the finances. But number four is over the $10,000 threshold already, which would need uh, select board approval. Uh, and it's kind of complicated. So we knew that we would be getting questions from you about this. So I just thought that I could have Mark and Phil explain to you exactly what this is and why it's necessary. And then you guys really can vote on it because that's what, you know, we could vote on it, but then you would have to vote on it anyway. So unless I misunderstand the protocol, I, we felt like this would be the most efficient way to get it done rather than waiting for another week, having you ask us questions we couldn't answer and then having to come back. Yeah. Before I before I vote on anything, I would like to know what the contingency fund is for any of these change orders. You mean what's left in the contingency? Correct, for any of yep. these change orders. Yep, so we our contingency is, we haven't spent anything out of the contingency yet. Um, we, these are our first change orders, so we have, we, we're carrying about a $300,000 contingency. Who knows where that will go at this point. Um, we do have things that were not funded yet. We will likely have to go into a contingency for. Uh, that includes our landscaping, which may be $40,000. It may be less. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with local folks about, you know, getting us plants at wholesale, et cetera, but just to use the 40,000 as our benchmark, because that was what the alternate bid was. And we also do not have our solar at this point, And our sort of price point for that is about $100,000. We have fundraised for that uh, to the tune of $30,000, but we still would be looking to basically spend $70,000 from the contingency for that um, if we had it left at the end of the project. Does that answer your question, Joyce? Uh, yes, in a in a sense, it does. It doesn't, you know. It tells me uh, what you might have to, uh, what you're looking at to do. But um, so that it gives me a rough idea. Thank you. Okay. So, Mark and Phil, if you could speak to number four, that would be awesome. Uh, Phil, I might have you jump in because I've. I've got a two minute warning before I have to jump off for a, another meeting, but <laughs> all right. I um, I, uh, as Allison mentioned, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but uh, not, not too, too much. Um, what basically happened is, is that the, the, the geometry of the structural steel in one section of the library, which is uh, this on the cell side, there's a small bay in the department that, that sticks out from the building toward the, toward the parking lot. Um, uh, in the direction of the church in the back of the library. Um, the geometry of, of the structural steel at the top of that bay where it sticks out from the slope roof, it's about, uh, it sticks out about two feet and the whole, the overall length of that is about 15 feet wide. Um, the structural steel extends left and right when you're looking at that bay a little further than we had shown on the architectural plan. So there's a difference between the architectural and the structural drawings. Structural engineers actually 
showed the, these small beams protruding out on the column lines and uh, these little, uh, these small uh, steel beams are actually welded directly to the columns, which is a much more efficient and cost-effective way to frame something like that. Our drawings actually showed them welded to a wide flange beam that ran between those two columns and were moved in slightly. Um, because they are, um, they are further out, uh, when we bring the masonry up on either side, as was originally planned, um, it leaves these two steel beams sticking out in the weather. Now, obviously we can't have that. Um, and so we modified the overhang at, the, uh, at this bay to, uh, to enclose that steel and put it inside where it belongs. And what that basically means is that the brick on either side, um, which again sticks out about two feet, uh, has been eliminated up at the very top. Um, and then some precast concrete over the top of the windows that acts as a lintel over the top of the windows, that goes away. And in the place of those materials on the two sides and along the front is a glass reinforced um, gypsum um, that we are using up on the higher parts, the kind of white higher parts uh, of the overhangs of the building. We're using that same material. So there's some additional material there that we need to buy. Uh, and then there's some carpentry framing uh, that need, they need to do, they need to put in there in order to support that material. Um, and then there is a small uh, credit that comes back on the brick that would happen on the two small sections on the left and the right um, that kind of weighs against that. And that is really the, 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 the credit on the masonry is really the difference between the, the amount of the original proposal uh, at 10769 and 10000 Oh, 071. That's really the difference there is that credit that we got back from the Mason. Um, and so this is really needed to enclose the building and incorporate the, the difference um, between our drawings and what shows on the structural drawings. Has the um, building committee seen a sketch of what this looks like or, or are they happy with what it looks like appearance wise? We, uh, we have uh, done sketches um, of this and uh, shared them with the building committee. I don't know that the building committee has voted on those or anything. Um, actually, I think that the um, given the overhaul appearance of, of this bay to have a little bit of a, uh, it's actually going to create a little bit of a larger uh, cap on the top of it. And I actually think it's going to look a little bit better. Um, and, and so it's, uh, it, I think it's you know it's a win in that case that it isn't going to look like an eyesore. It's actually going to be uh, it, it's actually going to be better than what we had originally had designed on there, uh, and that it's going to give it a little bit more of a substantial cap. And I think that's going to help tie it in with the rest of the overhangs that are on the building that are quite a bit larger. And it was very little overhang at this portion of the building before, uh, and it was a little bit of an odd man out. Um, so I think it's a it's probably a, a benefit in, the, in, in terms of the aesthetics. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure that they had seen it and knew what they're what the change was was encompassing and they were good with it and I'm okay with that so uh, Dave if I could just jump in before I have to leave and again I apologize but um, this is a very specific uh, detail uh, it's not it's not an, an egregious miss by somebody it's 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 a it's a detail uh, a, it's down deep in the structural drawings that doesn't match up with the detail in the architectural and it's nothing honestly that um, I think uh, we could have expected uh, either Phil's office or ourselves or the contractor, nobody picked it up until the framework was actually in place. And then they realized when they stepped back and did the architectural to structural that we had an issue that needed to be addressed. And so, and that's in part what the contingency uh, is for, to address items like this. Um, and as Allison mentioned, to date, we haven't had a single change order which is you know, extraordinary. We're roughly 60% through the project and haven't had any change orders yet. And uh, for new construction, I would expect three to 5% somewhere in there. So we're certainly well below um, where you would argue we could be at the beginning of the job. It doesn't mean that this it's $10,000 is, is a lot of money, but uh, because of the background of the situation and how it came about, uh, I'm happy with how the issue was resolved uh, aesthetically um, I approve of the cost. Uh, as Phil mentioned, it came down by $700 or something like that after we pursued a credit. Um, so I would, I would propose uh, to accept the proposal um, 
as as discussed. And with that, I, I've got to jump. I apologize again. Thanks, Mark. Right. Thanks, everybody. I'll make, I'll make a motion to accept the ten ten thousand dollar change order for this. Joyce, and this is Jack Sikowski here. I'm on the Library Building Committee. I, I'm just following up with this. Um, so is I understand that mistakes happen in building, but I'm just wondering, is there any kind of shared responsibility on this? I heard what Mark just said, that not many errors were made, but this is an error. Is there any way that it goes back on the design? Just want to put that question out to Phil. I know that Mark had to go away. Can I get a second on the motion, someone? I'll, I'll second the motion for discussion. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, let's let's talk about that. Uh, Phil, uh, is there anything as far as a, an error, uh, any more credit that we should be entitled to on that? Um, I, I understand the, the thought process behind that, um, and where it comes down to for me is whether or not uh, I feel uh, uh, that what we have done uh, has damaged the town. Um, and I guess it's you You probably all have to feel comfortable with that as well. Um, I, I don't feel that we have damaged the town. This is what I would characterize as a, uh, a value added change order. In other words, um, had, um, if we had found that spot on the structural drawings and, um, and discovered this early on, and modify the design prior to the bid, um, we would we have we would have eliminated the seven hundred dollars or so worth of masonry, and we would have added um, the three thousand dollars worth the additional framing and the seven thousand dollars worth the additional GFRC, uh, and the bid would have been higher. Um, so, and and you would have paid it uh, up front. Uh, um, this this is not, and so I, I, because of that, I don't think that this falls into a, a situation. Uh, um, that could be described as an error. I think this is a coordination issue, uh, an, an error where it might cause you damage. Um, we had designed something uh, wrong, and then you had to go back and pay somebody to take something down and then to repair it. Um, and because, uh, something that we did that was that was incorrect. This is this is a coordination issue. And, and as much as I would love to be able to um, never have these, uh, you know, I, I, I unfortunately can't. I, I can't offer that kind of a service. Um, I, I, we're, not, we're not infallible as much as I'd love to be able to, 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 to do that for you. Um, I, I don't know that I have a, a better explanation of it than, than that. Um, this, was a, this, was a, um, this was a cost that I advised uh, the, 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 the town of Hadley that they should uh, anticipate. Uh, that was backed up by your OPM and, and, um, and a contingency fund was put aside for it. Part of, part of what contingency pays for is things like this uh, only. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure that I mentioned a number of times specifically that there will be coordination issues uh, between me and my engineers and, um, and we can't pick up everything every time. Uh, you know, I, we, can't, we can't offer perfection and so we need, we need you to maintain some money in your budget um, and so this does fit within your budget and um, it's below what we had budgeted by a fair amount at this point in the project, as Mark mentioned, uh, which I am uh, gratified by. Um, it's, it's where we like to be. Yeah. No, I, you know, this, like uh, Mark said, there haven't been any other change orders. There haven't been any cases of oversight and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, as people can tell you with the senior center, uh, I'm more than happy to be all over someone when they're screwing up repeatedly, but um, you know this is a, a one-off, so I'm pretty comfortable with with uh, making the change on it. So we have a motion and, in, in a second, and it's, and it's something that's needed. So uh, you know, if it wasn't, if it was frivolous or something other than that, then no, this is something that actually is for the structure of the building. So I have no problem with that. All right. So motion to approve change order number four. Um, Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Can we instruct Phil O'Brien to make sure it doesn't happen again, though? Yeah. <laughs> I, will, I will do everything in my power. Of course, uh, you know, the documents are already out there. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we need to talk about any of the other ones, Allison? Thank you. Uh, not unless you have any questions about them. No. <laughs> No, that's good. Ed, you want to give us a quick update before you guys take off if you want to leave or anything? Or 
I think you've uh, you've pretty much gotten uh, our update. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you for uh, fitting us in early. All right, thank you. All right, so let's go back to uh, Tom real quick because he's waiting to talk about asparagus. He's, he's actually left. He sent me a message, David. No, I'm here. Uh, oh, you are here. We yeah, told you left. Got, no, I got to leave at ten line. of. I've got a fair. No, I got a four H fair meeting. I've got a chair oh. at ten <laughs> of. Typical man, Tom. For God's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> so I'll try to. I'll try to keep this really quick. It's, this is uh and if yeah, at least I can lay it on the table and then you can discuss it. It's it's not any time sensitive uh, matter. Uh, but for a number of reasons, uh, one is asparagus season is fast approaching if it does warm up. Uh, and two, we, you know, we've all been going through this incredibly crazy time. And uh, it's time for a, a feel good story in town and have people rally around something that we can really build on positively besides all the, these great buildings. I, I understand that. Um, so I remember back in the day when, you know, we saw these four entrance signs, welcome to Hadley, the asparagus capital of the world. And over the decades, wonder where are those signs and why aren't we celebrating this? So it just came to a, a point uh, this year where I felt it was time to speak up and see if we can claim or reclaim uh, that right as the asparagus capital of the world. Just a note, I was kind of going through the names and knowing I might miss a number of them because there are dozens. I look at Sikowski, Spipchinski, Zahowski, Wiskevitz, Gnatics, Rex, and Boisverts. Uh, there's others out there that were major growers and continued to uh, grow asparagus, and there's a resurgence now. How about how about Chunglo? We had Chunglo, the ch I, I, That's we why had I was I, I, acres back in the day. I, I didn't <laughs> want to mention. I knew I'd miss them, but the the, the list is almost endless. So I did a little research. Uh, you can all do that on Google, and I looked at WordPress, Savoir Magazine, Yankee Magazine, 2007, South Shore Organics, 2015. Of course, all our local papers, the Gazette, Republican, a Recorder, Montague Reporter all proclaim Hadley is the asparagus capital of the world uh, and nobody challenges on it. But I wanted to look across the country and the world to see if anybody else had this claim to fame. And the only place I could find is a place called Oceana County in Michigan. So I called up their town manager and spoke to him for a while and uh, said, like, how did you get that? And they're countywide. They're not a town, uh, western side of the, of the state. And he didn't know. So he... Uh, got back to me after he talked to a number of people and nobody knows how they got the name. He thinks they self-proclaimed uh, themselves that. And uh, it's, I said, well, do you want to arm wrestle for it or, or how, how, how much are you going to fight this? He said, we're not. We, it's, it's, it gives us a chance to celebrate and pull the community together. And I said, yeah, we want that. And I talked about our history at Hadley where, you know, our Hadley asparagus has been in uh, the white house. It's been in Harris. It's been in, uh, London, and uh, we've all got all kinds of international attention, and uh, that I th I'd like to bring it up to our select board. I said that uh, we 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 claim it, and he said go for it. So uh, I sent an email to you earlier to that effect, also to to uh, David, and just want to see what your thoughts are. I'm not going to live or die with this. I I would love to see it uh, proclaimed to across the land that we are. We have the best asparagus in the world. That's without a doubt. Um, the best soil, you know, it's, it's just world renowned. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a great idea. I know uh, Matt Kushai has been working hard on the agricultural uh, commission, trying to get that up and running and more active. And I know he wanted to put up some signs for the town. And I think this is a, a great step in that direction. Sure. Yeah. What can we do to help you, Tom? Well, I didn't know how official you wanted to make it. We can, we can pop the signs up. We can proclaim it. Uh, do we go up the ladder? Do we go to the senator? Do we ask for a Senate or governor proclamation, you know, like Cranberry Capital of the World? Or, or, or do you want to not get into that? Do you just want to be self-proclaimed or, 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 not, or not do it? I, I just want to bring it up. It seems like a real good feel story is in time. It, it's needed right now. And I almost feel it's our rights. We've got it. Uh, well, I think, so I than, think uh, John Scheibach used to bring a case of asparagus to the uh, the House of Representatives uh, every spring season, <laughs> and he so absolutely did. So they're all aware of uh, our asparagus down at the House, and uh, I I think we should petition and uh, uh, the town do a proclamation and have it signed off by us and also by the Senate and the House of Representatives. I think it would be great. 
I'd like, I'd like to, to, I'd like to I'd nail like this. I'd really it. like to have it officially. If that's my my stance, but you know, or at least die trying. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I Don't think do that. <laughs> I, I just think you know we've we for so many reasons we got the largest amount of preserved land. We got the best soil, as I said. <laughs> our our heritage is is incredible. Most of you picked asparagus at one point in your life, I imagine. Um, my son did right is, you. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> So. <laughs> I, I I would like to make a motion that Hadley do a proclamation uh, and also petition the House and the Senate uh, to declare Hadley the uh, capital of asparagus for the asparagus United States. capital of the world. Yes. Yeah. Nobody across the world actually is claiming it. Not 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 just the U.S. I uh, think nobody is claiming it. Across the world, then we'll go yeah. for it, Tom. Big right. time. I'll yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing, everyone. Thanks Thank you, Tom. Take Stay care, safe. everybody. You, you too. too. Okay. All right. Let's um, let's go back to the fire station and senior center. Let's do those two updates. Joyce or uh, Jane, who wants to go first? Fire station, I can just uh, lightly say there's been no change. Uh, nothing on this end of it. They continue to work diligently to get it done and they're moving along inside, outside. Uh, things are looking good up there. So uh, I think next week we should be having a finance meeting of some sort. Bill's been on vacation this week. Uh, so I'll have more to offer at our next meeting. All right, great. Jane, how about the Senior Center? Senior Center is moving along well. As you heard from the library, there are some workers who choose not to work, so crews are smaller, but all the crews are available. Finally, the paving is done, the striping is done with the Legion, and that looks really good. There's still a few striping things to be done, in our lot because there's some heavy equipment where they were when they were painting, but they, that's easy to fix. Um, they're working inside. The electricity finally will be hooked up on um, Friday. That's been an issue, as you know. So that's that will help all our other systems get going. Do you have a revised completion date at this point or is it too soon to say what things going on? Um, well, we're tentatively looking to move our things from Most Holy Redeemer into the new site May 25th. Great. All right. Did we ever uh, discuss uh, extending the lease on Most Holy Redeemer for another month or another month of rent? I don't know if David Nixon is there. Yeah, so I talked to Haley Wood about that. Um, and it looks like we're going to extend it one more month. I asked if there's some way that we could put everything in, in boxes and they talked about, she talked about needing the space for the uh, meals program, the groceries, the meals on wheels. Um, and so it sounds like they need that uh, space on a weekly basis. So one more month. I do wonder if you could argue a lower rent since we're hardly using it. I can make that inquiry. Okay. Let's uh, talk about meetings. Let's do for May and June. Okay. Uh, David, was, was there any resolution last uh, week? I kind of, I did chime in on the meeting. Um, I saw it on one on the uh, TV channel. Um, about the solar panels for the senior center, is that uh, where are we on that? I had I, I would like to chime in on that discussion. Well, I think we said we were going to table it for sixty days, if I remember. Um, I think sixty that's days. What, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to to be clear that uh, it was not an ad alternate. Uh, yes, we do have a contingency fund for the senior center, but. Again, it was not part of their ad alternate of uh, using their money. So uh, it, just in chiming in and holding it for 60 days, just uh, like people to be aware of that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So for meetings for May, I have, uh, let me pull the calendar up real quick. I have May 6th, 
which is, I'm sorry, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> that would be the first Wednesday of the month. Yeah. Yep. Are we going to do it then? I'm looking at the wrong month here. So be easier when I do this. No, you're right. May 6th. May okay. 6th. May 6th and then uh, May 20th as meetings. Those look good for me right now. Okay. And then uh, we have the election scheduled the 16th. So the 20th will be the first uh, meeting after the election. Uh -huh. And then for June, I have June 3rd and 17th. Uh, I guess we'll wing it by the seat of our pants by then, I guess. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. yeah. But, as but, far as I know, the, you know, my schedule right now at the office is just until the middle of May. Okay. Uh, I think, as I said in the beginning of the meeting, we're looking to possibly start doing some surgeries in the middle of May. Um, that I will know by tomorrow after they have their meeting at the hospital. Um, so um, hopefully things are starting. We'll start to open up a little bit. So, uh, and whatever Governor Baker uh, also says on things opening up gradually. So I guess we'll all play it by ear. All right. So we'll do those, those four tentatively for now. Uh, or actually we'll schedule those for now. And if we need to add extras for whatever comes up, we can do that. But for now, at least we can use those to plan. What about town meeting, David? Well, I see Randy's here. Um, and so why don't we talk about that? Just, just a question on the schedule. Are, are we going to do 5.30 on these or what time? That would be fine for me if it is for everybody else. Yeah, as long as we're Zooming, I guess that works fine. I think if we have to be somewhere in part, going back to in-person meetings, we'll probably move them back later. But uh, 5.30, I think, seems to work. Is that okay with you, Christian? Or? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. 5.30, unless we go to face-to-face, -face, and then is it back to 6.30 again? Yeah, that works for me. Okay. All right, so uh, town meeting. Randy's here, and uh, David Nixon, do you want to, you have any ideas? I do. Um, I had uh, a while ago tentatively um, uh, put in my book that town meeting could be held sometime in the middle of June, and I had uh, written in June 18th as a possible date. This is before I knew that the school would be closed through the rest of the semester. Um, we, we are in a situation where I have a, a, a budget that I'm still working on. It is in balance. Um, there are some research uh, questions I want to get into in the next 48 hours before I have a, a budget that I think I can pre uh, present and, and articulate as being in the best interest of the town. Uh, if we if we hold it on June 18th, that's plenty of time. You could hold it on June 11th, and that also works. Anybody have any thoughts one way or another? 11th, 18th, Randy? I think, I think the later, the better, based on conditions. And I think we're, I mean, we're going to shoot for whatever date we shoot for and hope for the best that the uh, state will allow us to have the meeting. I think... Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Later, the better at this point. And I think a big, a big deal is we need to talk with somebody, at least on the local board of health, if not uh, state health agencies, to, to get input from them as to whether it is considered safe to do this and in what venue. So I, I, I do think that we should try to do this outside if weather if the weather cooperates, get some speakers, people can space out more on the soccer fields or even in the parking lot and uh, better than being inside if the weather's good. So, yes, I agree with that. So Randy, you did make that change to the, uh, to the warrant that you suggested. So we can use the interior or exterior of the building that that'll work just fine. Okay, that's good. That'll keep us out of trouble with somebody <laughs> if we have to be outside. I think Joyce was trying to say something, but was muted. She's still muted. Yeah, she still is. Still muted. Joyce, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Now, now we, can. we can. Oh, great. 
So I was thinking that we will know by the middle of May what Governor Baker uh, is going to start lifting, uh, whether it be June or May. I think we'll have a better idea. I think June 18th is a good date to at least set our sights on, uh, whether it be inside or outside. I think we're going to have to look at that carefully. Yes, I agree with that. And there's been some interesting uh, scenarios talked about at the Massachusetts Moderators Association where they'll, they'll have two seats together for couples who live together. So it's okay for them to be together and then spread out, you know, they had a couple section and a single section. So we can, we can figure all that stuff out when the time comes, if need be. Can, okay. we, have a, can we have a dating section? Sure. Whoever lives together, votes together. How's that? But not One necessarily. Thing how do you share a microphone? And <laughs> that, that stuff's going to be interesting. You yeah. know, if we still are under the, the situation, then you're, you're going to have to wipe the microphone down every time somebody uses it. That's correct. So That's correct. Absolutely. It's going to be very interesting to coordinate this thing. Not yeah. if they all have a mask on. Well, even still, John, I, I think to be safe, we would have to, to wipe them. I mean, I think okay. we're going to require everybody to have a mask and we're still going to have to wipe stuff down because we don't right. want it to be responsible for people getting sick. Yeah, let me chime on this. Even if they think they're going to go up there with a pair of gloves on and it's going to be okay, people are not using their gloves the proper way either. So don't go on that aspect of it. What about the hand yeah. question? Give it to one person. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll deal with all of that when the time comes. We'll have to sit down with everybody and come up with a, a very detailed plan to make sure we're as safe as we possibly can be. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Can I get a motion? Motion to accept June 18th as the date of the annual town meeting. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So... Let's talk about uh, COVID-19 update and general response. Uh, David Nixon, do you want to give an update on, or actually the, looks like the chief, fire chief's here. Hi, fire chief. Chief Spanknable, do you want to give us an update on uh, COVID-19 in town? I was kind of just listening. Uh, if David had something planned, uh, I can add off of anything if you, if you have any other questions. Um, Okay. So if David has something, I'd let him go first. Thanks. Yeah, so I, uh, I was just going to summarize by saying that uh, we're continuing to update the uh, Hadley website on COVID-19. and That can be found at www.hadley.ma.org. Uh, uh, let me say that again, www.hadleyma.org. Um, and uh, people should check that uh, because there's quite a lot of material and it's updated uh, uh, daily. Uh, so the, con the Unified Command continues to meet. Uh, we're addressing the challenges that uh, coronavirus provides for us. Um, we're, um, the Mike Spanknable, you did a, a great job on getting that intermunicipal agreement for the uh, shelter for the first responders. Um, it looks like we have uh, uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is trying to get uh, some emergency money for us for various projects. Uh, and I think the town is responding well uh, to the, uh, the crisis. And I, I'd like to respond on that also. Um, I get daily updates on uh, Cooley Dickinson and what we are treating at the hospital. Uh, we are uh, not at, at uh, we are seeing a steady decline in the number of patients that we are treating. Yes, we have, I think we had 81 uh, people go through our testing units yesterday, but uh, that has been lifted on the uh, types of uh, testings that we can do for people. Um, so there was, has been an increase in that. There was a little bit of an increase in inpatients at the hospital, but they were not COVID patients. Um, so we have seen a decline in that also. As of note, the uh, surrounding nursing homes are, most of the patients in the nursing homes are DNR, DNI, which means that they are 
not being uh, resuscitatable, so they're not going to the hospital at that point. Uh, but again, their numbers are not up there where we would even consider them. We have not had any increase in COVIDs at any of our local nursing homes. So um, all in all, I think that we're at a plateau right now. Um, it's what they're telling us. So in this area, I feel very good and positive about um, what we have um, to deal with. So uh, everybody stay doing what they're doing, wearing masks, washing your hands, and uh, staying in place like you're supposed to be. Yeah, the, uh, the numbers are somewhat slowing down for our town. We're up to 17 positives according to the state numbers that were released today. So not okay. a huge increase, which is good. So we're kind of slowing down there. Mr. Good. Chair, could I say something? Yes. So the set rep, the sit rep yesterday, the reason why it's so important for folks to check it out is uh, we put a new section in yesterday on voter registration and getting folks um, information on the upcoming annual election. So if they could check that out, there's all sorts of links and ways that folks can uh, get absentee ballots and everything that they need. Also contact information with the town clerk. And then the state did update their their site for uh, information. Um, if you click on the link up at the top under state by the numbers, there's a whole new spreadsheet out now with all sorts of information on all the COVID uh, confirmed cases, new, new patients, the hospital loads, everything. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of information on there. There's new information from the schools. Yesterday, uh, Superintendent McKen McKenzie uh, put out a letter. So we're really urging folks to, to check that out. It's updated daily and there's a lot of really good info on it. And uh, just one other thing, just to say thank you. Uh, we did our fourth week of delivering groceries to seniors. Uh, we did 16 deliveries today. And I just wanted to say thank you to the members of the department that helped out with that. And uh, we had uh, one volunteer from Council on Aging and we'll be adding another person next week from Council on Aging most likely. So that's been running very smoothly and we have it down to a pretty rapid pace now. Um, uh, obviously items are still kind of, the shortfalls at the grocery stores, but we've been getting folks what they need. And if anybody's not aware of that, um, the system that we have in place, just, how, just reach out to the Council on Aging if you're ha having a hard time getting out to get groceries if you're 60 years of old or older. Uh, we'd be help, happy to help you out. So you can check that out at the Council on Aging. Thank you. Randy had something. Hey, hey Mike, is it possible for you to put out on the town-wide uh, phone notice system about the absentee ballots just to make sure that the maximum amount of people are aware that they should get one if they can? Uh, the town clerk just gave me an order to put something <laughs> out on <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that is, but uh, yes, we'll be putting something together with Jennifer. Jennifer is uh, has been doing awesome with everything, and she will help us make sure she'll make sure I do it the right way. I'm sure. So yes, we'll be doing that. Yeah, I know Jennifer asked me, and maybe you want to do this now, uh, David. Is uh, we were talking about doing a reverse nine one one call with the uh, with an announcement. I was going to read the announcement later during the announcements, uh, but that's something we were thinking of doing. Yeah, and I, I think we're filming a uh, PSA on Friday on this issue, too. And uh, Randy, I, I apologize, but I guess we got to go back to town meeting warrant. This is my first day on the job here, so I didn't mean to skip around on you. But uh, David Nixon and Randy, anything on the town meeting warrant we need to do? Um, not that I'm aware of yet. It's still in the pre preliminary stage, so I'm sure David's going to have some adjustments to it. And as he makes his adjustments, he always sends it to me and I will review it at that point. And if anything comes up, I will certainly let everybody know. Yeah, I'm, re I'm, re I'm rewriting um, uh, a lot of the financial part of the warrant in order to take pressure off our financial situation right now. So uh, nothing to present to the select board right yet. Okay, sounds right. good. So then uh, let's talk about chapter 53 of the acts of 2020. What do we have there, David? What do we need to do? 
All right, so we have two options, uh, two choices, and uh, Susan and I had a conversation this afternoon, and we're, we, um, we have a recommendation for the first option and a recommendation against the second option. The first option is to uh, defer the due date of the real estate taxes from May 1st to June 1st. Um, and the other option is to waive the interest and penalties for late payments up to June 30th. We're not in favor of that, uh, that part, the waiving of the interest and the penalties. I, I uh, the first option would, the first option would cost us about eleven thousand dollars roughly and the second option would cost an additional um, twelve thousand dollars David or Susan would that include um, the escrow feed well, no, Molly, and I have a call in to uh, Mike McFadden from uh, CoreLogic, which is a huge tax service. Okay. Um, we end up with about 400,000 escrow payments from them. Uh, he did not call me back today. However, other towns are getting uh, the CoreLogic, the Wells Fargo, the Loretta payments, um, and those are tax services that um, banks essentially employ to handle their escrow services. Um, so I'm, I'm not so concerned about that as much as I was last week, uh, because I was getting calls from every tax service saying, are you extending, are you? Yeah, I mean, they already have our money. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, well, and that, and that is my point to all of them that have called. I, I'm not certain why you're concerned about this. You want to hold on to monies that are due the town of Hadley um, so that you can make interest versus us be able to pay our bills. So, so is there a possibility of us um, keeping the date of the uh, taxes of what it's supposed to be, but possibly not uh, penalizing anybody that might pay in June? Would that be a possibility, Susan, without any problems? The problem that I run into is that I have the authority to waive $15 in interest, mm -hmm. uh, which I've been doing for our excise tax payments. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when this all hit, our excise was due. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark. <laughs> he, wants, he wants to get in on this every week, doesn't he? <laughs> I said to Mark before I unmuted, "Get the dog out of here." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but uh, so I've been able to waive uh, late payments for excise tax because it's within my authority. When you get into, you know, $1,500 tax bills, the interest at 14% a day builds up pretty quickly. So I don't have that ability. Um, there are a number of towns in the area who are not changing their tax date because they have not seen um, a huge decrease in payments. And I'll be honest with you, I went through and looked at our figures from this year to last year, and we are almost within uh, two one hundredths of one percent, uh, right up with our collections. So, so we, we don't. Re so we don't need to change it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we're right on schedule where we've been, and actually the same with the excise. So. Uh, can we do what we talked about in the past is that uh, we keep the deadline the same and, and you know, the, the penalties and whatnot the same for now, but tell anybody who needs help to contact you in advance and see what they can work out and leave it at that? I mean, that works for me. Uh, I've always worked with our folks, so. Yes, you have, Susan. Thank you. 
And you mentioned delegation of authority to, to that you personally, as the collector, have the right to waive, like up into up to the fifteen. Up to fifteen dollars. So, in a situation, if we run into a situation where there are people who get into some trouble, um, and they do or something, to, does it then go to the select board to do the waiving, or? Uh, no, that would go to the assessors because they would have to uh, abate a portion of the tax. Okay. Right. Okay. It just seems like we, we should be able to work it out. I, I think we can. I just say, then I'll make a motion to leave it as is, our tax collection. Second for David's comment, if David thinks differently. David Nixon. Um, yeah, but uh, Susan and I uh, um, compared notes with respect to our revenue stream through March. Uh, she, she and I agree that uh, we're strong on connection uh, collections. We're exactly where we should be compared to where we were this time last year. Um, uh, it's written many times in the budget book that if you're having trouble, uh, get in touch with Susan and she'll work with you uh, and Linda as well. Um, work with with you to uh, help out with a payment schedule of some kind. Um, so I I'm not um, I I I am okay with the deferring of the tax bills to June first. But if that's not something we're prepared to do right now, that's okay by me. All right, motion. The other thing is, I think where we're, if this goes on much longer, where we're going to see our issue is August 1st. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I just assume keep this for now and then look at something later on. Okay. If we're allowed to by the governor. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Correct. I don't know if we're going to solve any major issues right now, but yeah, if this keeps going on, then we're going to have more issues, I think. So, yeah. And it, um, I was in on a user group meeting with Vader. There are a number of towns that are not changing uh, at all. They're doing as much as they can within uh, allowing waiver of interest and that type of thing within authorities. Um, one thing they did say was that uh, we're going to need to keep a really close line on the third quarter actual bills for next year um, because uh, the state is, is putting out there, you need to prepare for doing preliminary bills for third quarter instead of actual tax bills. Um, the only slowdown that I would ever see right now is if the state didn't have enough people to approve our stat, uh, our tax rate. And I talked to Dan Zadonik about this today. Some towns, uh, and I, I have to say big kudos to Dan because he does a fabulous job um, because a lot of towns are not hearing anything from their assessors uh, and Dan's Johnny on the spot. So uh, we're lucky in that respect. Um, I don't foresee, un, I don't foresee a problem with the recap now with our new accounting firm. I don't foresee a problem with the values with Dan. So I think, you know, we'll be okay as long as, as they have people on the other end to process and approve our tax rates. Right. And I'd like to amplify that we, uh, we met with the accounting uh, group today uh, speaking specifically about a schedule for doing the end of year report, the, uh, the audit, the free cash certification. Um, all of that uh, is, is something that they feel that they can do in a very short time frame. Uh, if we have our fall time meeting in, in October, uh, there should be a reason why we should go to estimated third quarter tax bills. Yay. <laughs> All right. I'll have, uh, keeping the due date and the penalties and whatnot uh, the same for Joyce's motion. Hi. 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 All right. 
All right, so we'll, we'll move on to um, community development block grant. Uh, David, any updates on that? Yeah, we're still waiting for DHCD to come up with their rules and regulations. We've been fleshing out the, uh, the, the, the demographic survey of the seniors in order to put together uh, a better services for the, uh, the, the senior community. Uh, so that we can uh, develop the town as a uh, age-friendly and dementia-friendly community. That's certainly going to be an eligible cost. Uh, uh, Haley Wood has been working hard on pulling that uh, together. Um, and um, Molly has been talking to the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce and the Business Improvement District uh, about a possible loan program. Uh, Molly, do you? want to speak a little bit about that yeah i mean i mean for everybody's read in the newspapers or online that many towns are trying to put together some form of a relief package um leveraging off of the um, community development block grant so in amherst they actually have a, a bid that has a board and they're trying to do something uh, on a fundraising basis to see if they can fund kind of a, a gap pool of resources to help local businesses stay afloat. Um, so I've been trying to do a little bit of legwork and, and Hadley just talking to some of the businesses to find out, you know, for the federal programs uh, that are available, you know, how are they working for you? Is that enough? And what I'm hearing is that every situation is unique and depending on the structure of the workforce and the nature of the business, um, whether they own their property, whether they rent, they're gonna have a different fact pattern. And some of them are definitely going to be running into trouble. Um, so any access they could get to any other resources would be beneficial, of course. And does it make sense for the town to try to support those businesses in any way? Um, you know, so the challenge is that the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce has made it very clear they're here to support Hadley as well. Um, they don't have any money, um, but they certainly can do a lot of legwork for us and try to help. And I guess the question is, do we want to think about any way for us to fund some sort of program like that? Is there anything available, David, as far as th that the town can do? I mean, we can combine this with the uh, letter F under this section of, you know, what we can do to boost the local economy and get things started back up. I mean, is there anything we could be doing as a town moving forward? And Molly, is there anything that, you know, the Chamber of Commerce would like to see the town of Hadley do? I think the Chamber of Commerce is really, they just want to make it clear that, you know, they're happy to be a convener of ideas and keep us notified. Um, again, they can't provide any level of funding, but to the extent um, they get any level of experience working in the town of Amherst itself through the bid, and that any of those ideas can translate to Hadley, they want to share those with us. Um, and don't, you know, don't react too strongly to this. But you know, my first thought was looking at our own balance sheet. You know, do we have any resources in the town that we could theoretically carve out some sort of modest amount of money uh, to make available, whether, you know, for some sort of a, a lending program, you know, would they be paid back? Um, and I, I ran kind of short other than actually looking to the town stabilization fund, which. Um, yeah. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> no. There we are. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna be five. We're gonna be over five hundred thousand dollars in the hole, according to Mr. Nixon, throughout <laughs> so this whole. We would want to look pandemic. at it in, in concert with our own budget, because the other thing we have to consider is how many of these businesses might go out, and what is that revenue impact going to be on us for the long term, anyway. So, so it's a bit of a balancing act. I'm certainly not suggesting that we carve out hundreds of thousands of dollars, but on the other hand, if we could think about putting something together like that, 
Um, you know, and again, is there any matching money coming in? So the state just announced, I think some, uh, the attorney general's office just came out with a, some sort of a grant program, you know? So maybe we can just see if we can cobble something together. Actually, I think the feds just, their next phase is going to be for municipalities and towns and cities and stuff like that. I don't know how much money they were talking, but they're, they were just mentioning it now today. I seen on the news. So. Yeah. So I looked, I looked, I looked into the attorney general grant program. It is a loan program. She has $500,000 and the maximum application can be 50. Thousand dollars. So if you do the math, that's ten businesses across the Commonwealth. Um, so you know, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll apply. I'll see if we can't get some of that money. Um, but my th thinking is that it's probably been snapped up already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe we could talk to. Um, I could talk to the chamber about trying to do a little bit more direct out to businesses that aren't able to be open right now and get some more specificity around what it is they might need. I mean, obviously we, we can't make a handout for a business that's not viable, right? That doesn't make any sense. Um, but if it's a lifeline and it's short term in nature, maybe we can figure something out. Yeah, absolutely. Something, right. that, something that Christian and I were talking about when Christian was uh, the chair is the uh, Community Preservation Act as a way to reboot the economy. Um, Christian, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I was just trying to think of ways that uh, we have a AAA bond rating and what can we use it to kind of inject money back into the community. I mean, I know we were anti the solar panels on the senior center, but that is a way we have a, a project budget. We have a low interest rate. Um, we could be putting money into the economy with a project that has a payback, but I'm not going to dwell on that. But CPA, I think, is good because we have money there. Um, there are projects we can do. I mean, we've already gotten CPA money uh, approved through the CPA committee to um, do some renovation work on the Goodwin Library, the current library, once it's vacated by the current library. Um, but are there other projects out there that we can do for the community with those CPA funds that would create jobs? So, David, we had talked when this whole COVID-19 thing started about accelerating some of those projects in town, like the columns on the town hall and, and some of the renovations and, and whatever else we could do in order to put that money back into the local economy with contractors. Is there anything that we can we can do along those lines now? Yeah, so so we've awarded the column work, and we need to uh, get the notice to proceed out the door. Um, there's some projects that are coming up that we have the money for that we have got on the bidding, uh, so we can move that that stuff forward. I think part of it, we were we were wondering where we uh, would land with respect to the library project and. You know, if we're if we're not settled on the library project, then it was harder to start some of these other projects up. But now that we are, uh, we could go full bore on them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, let's let's get it rolling instead of keeping the money in the bank and let it sit in there. Let's uh, let's get the work done and and get the money in the contractors' hands so they can pay their employees. Will do. All right. Um, all right. So Amy Fighting's here. And uh, let's talk about the budget. Uh, I know you're still working on it, but um, where are we and, and what are we looking at? So uh, you want me to speak or Amy? Well, you can go first. You're already here and then Amy, I'm, Amy can go. <laughs> All right, so um, I did give you a progress report as to where we are with the budget. And the budget is, we're actually in the black a little bit uh, by about seven grand. Um, the principles that we are trying to um, do is a achieve a balanced budget. Um, B think about F by 2022 and make sure that whatever we're doing today is not going to put us in a bad place tomorrow. So we don't uh, we don't want to uh, make the wrong decisions strategically. Um, 
there's a lot of things that people have asked for that are entirely reasonable uh, that we're simply not going to be able to support. Uh, expanded services, new positions, uh, higher rates of pay, um, that kind of stuff. A lot of that is going to be put on hold. I think it's safe to say that uh, formally we the budget uh, that I presented on February 19th was a budget that envisioned expanded services. And now the budget that I have prepared in draft form, uh, we are going to be in a crouching position for at least a year. Um, trying to make sure that we protect our reserves, trying to make sure that we have explored all the uh, uh, all the things that strategically we should be exploring at this time. Uh, so that includes special assessments and whether we can defer them for one year, uh, whether we should be splitting the tax rate, uh, whether we should be engaging in a spending freeze from May 2020 to June 2020 in order to build free cash for next year whether we should get another marijuana license in, in addition to the uh, the two that we have. Um, and uh, oil, uh, we are going out to bid for oil right now. And so we're going to try to uh, get some uh, savings from the prices that we have been reading about in the newspaper. So that in a nutshell is where, uh, and capital projects that, uh, that have been asked for at the annual town meeting, we're gonna defer almost 90% of them to the fall town meeting, leaving only those capital projects that are either mandated or absolutely necessary in the best interests of the town. Okay, I would just comment that although I'm, uh you know all about looking at the tax rate and possibly splitting it and considering the options there i don't think this this year is the year to do it and and hit businesses even harder by splitting that rate when they're already kind of down and out so i i, I don't think that's something we should be looking at for this year especially so yeah. but, uh, go, ahead, go ahead amy what do you have well i just think that uh i um can you hear me right yeah Okay, so I want. I just wanted to say, if I when I looked at the budget, it was really what I did was I took last year's salaries and then I just uh, times you know gave two percent increase. That's it, um, and I came up with a lot. You know, no extra hours, no extra positions. Um, so just you're not laying off anybody. Um, so everyone's keeping their their jobs. Um, so I thought that was going to just, just nothing extra. And then I cut oh, some of the fuel uh, spots. I thought maybe we can cut because gas prices are down right now. So I thought maybe we could take advantage of that. And so I, I you know, I, I just, those were some of my thoughts. I did uh, send out just what my thoughts were to everyone um, in the spreadsheet. So if you take a look at it, because when um, we were looking at it, it was, it was closer, it was like a million, I added back in the two and a half because I'd rather not see us hit our, um, our residents with another two and a half percent on top, the proposition two and a half. Um, I, I'd rather just see the flat, same tax rate. Um, so I was hoping to, you know, take that looking at a million dollars, not the 500,000. So that's where the numbers were when I was looking at it, was a million dollars to make up out of that budget. Um, Yes, I did say that, you know, maybe not put back the uh, 246000 of stabilization that we took out, um, maybe try to put that back another time, um, maybe just not at this time, um, and use some free cash. But I did leave the, some free cash for next year because you don't, like David said, you don't want to cut it too thin. Um, and, and there are some other ideas out there, too, on where we could uh, come up with some money. We did look at, there are two increases that I'd like to see. One increase that's still in there is the increase to paying down extra principal and, and debt so that if we did need some capital items, we have more room to borrow without hitting the tax rate. So, you know, that was still, that's still in there. Also looked at maybe increasing the 
um, finance uh, reserve. So that way in the middle of the year, if someone gets low or needs the money, we could transfer it without town meeting. So that's, that's the reserve that I think we should put some money into in case we need it in the middle of the year. Amy, two so, questions? Sure. So, so Amy, and, uh, Amy and I are thinking very much alike on uh, this on this budget. I think there's some differences between our specific recommendations, but in general, we're, uh, we're very similar. Um, two questions. One is, um, is the OPEB funding left in the budget? No. Well, I, 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 I was thinking maybe we could take, you know, a little bit from it. Right now we have, uh, with doing the increase that we say we're gonna do every year, it's 277,000. Um, so I said, well, what if we fund only 200,000 this year and, 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 and just leave off the 77,000? You know, I, I mean, we're still way ahead of all the other towns. Right, So yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I think that whole amount really could be on the table. Um, these are, extraordinary times on the one hand the argument now might be a great time to put the money in because <laughs> the market's so bad you know but um so so maybe not cut it to zero but it does seem like that's worth looking at and then i guess the other question i have is and i don't even i, I have to think that the the nature of the school budget is going to change in some way um, and I don't think anybody has their head wrapped around that yet, but, you know, just wondering if, you know, we should really stay close to Annie and the school committee and they're thinking, um, you know, are there any line items that might be swinging on their end that could reduce um, the overall funding? I, I don't know. You know? Yeah, so I, I, I did have a very long conversation with uh, Ann McKenzie. Uh, she's going to be providing me with some numbers uh, tomorrow or Friday. Um, and uh, so, yeah, she's working on, on that angle. Um, I did uh, reduce the funding for OPEB to zero for one year. Um, since we have 19 and a quarter percent of our unfunded liability covered, uh, we can defer for a year um, in order to to take pressure off of uh, free cash elsewhere. Um, anything from the assessor? Dan, you want to jump in on anything on here? Uh, not really. Other than the, the two and a half, I know you're looking at keeping the same tax rate. We're probably going to be going up on values this year, which means the tax rate will actually drop. I think what you're probably looking more at is keeping the same tax bill or a similar tax bill rather than the tax focusing on the tax rate. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. So, um, so that's, that's going to require a lot of study because what we don't want to do is we don't want to put us in a position where we have uh, said thank you, but no thank you for $300,000 of a tax proposition two and a half increase um, and then find ourselves having to make that up to by six hundred thousand dollars the next year so we don't want to we don't want to create a situation where we've stretched an elastic band and then it snaps and creates real hardship next year so uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of variables we're gonna have to work through and happy to sit down and uh, plan this all out so that it has the best of results, not only immediately, but also for next year. I was going to ask you on uh, the, uh, for Dan, uh, you know, just if housing values, if we think, you know, based on something like this, are they going to stay pretty steady or is there, you know, what way are we looking at? So kind of that same question. Um, but then just another thing I saw that Amy, you had taken out was the planner. And I really think we should be looking at adding a planner um, right now. I mean, we're in this crisis. I feel like it's a really good opportunity to try to make some changes and try to do some things that could change our economic situation or look at things in town to rethink how we're doing things. Um, 
There might be grant money out there. There's going to be a lot of initiatives to create jobs. And I feel like having a planner could be something that helps to bootstrap a lot of that stuff and put some plans in place that might make changes that we need and Hadley just to find businesses that can survive and um, continue to thrive here. I agree that we probably do need a planner and I agree with that. But when we, when we, in, you know, had the planning board come to us and talk to us about um, their budget, they, I don't, they made it me feel that they weren't ready for that yet. They weren't ready for a full-time planner that they wanted to, they wanted more time. They needed to, you know, do some research on it. So they are still having another 7,500 in their budget to help um, um, with that. Um, but I think just the 7,500 might be enough to get them by this year to make that plan. They just didn't seem ready. They did not seem, I, I watched the uh, select board meeting talking about the planner, thought it was you know a good idea for a full-time planner before of all this happened. And then when we interviewed them, it just, they didn't, it didn't sound like they were quite ready to do it this year for a full-time planner, but an employee. Okay. So well, the, the problem with a position like that is it takes, there's, there's a lot of research and investigation that needs to happen. You know, if the planner is going to be looking at zoning changes and the like, and, you know, I know that the, well, you know, the, the planning board has been crying for help. And I, for lack of a better way to put it, to use their own language, they will be one year older <laughs> um, a year from now, right? So, uh, and that's been the real concern. It's that brain trust that exists with a very small number of, of individuals. And so obviously this is going to be an unbelievably difficult budget cycle. And, you know, generally speaking, I agree with the idea of some sort of a freeze to make sure that we're not laying anybody off or, you know, doing, taking any drastic measures like that. But on the other hand, um, it would be my opinion that the first thing we want, would want to try to add back in would absolutely be that planner because we could very well see a change in the landscape of the commercial district. We don't know who is going to fare well and who's not gonna fare well. And there may be some pretty significant re, um, you know, rethinking that needs to happen. And only time is gonna tell, but you want somebody who's skilled in looking at that and not trying to deal with two part-time, you know, part-time select board and a part-time planning board to, to affect change. And, and I would say that any change we're going to go through right now is going to be challenging. And I think, you know, Linda's on, I don't know if Bill is listening, but, um, you know, it's tough to change and we're asking them to change a little bit and putting this planner in place, which is going to be a change of how they would do business. But I see this planner as helping the planning board, but I also see them as being a town person that's looking at economic development opportunities, grant opportunities, helping with the DPW. I mean, there's a lot of needs we have in town to, uh, to, to plan things out. And I don't think it's a specific position for the planning board. I also wanted to mention that, you know, when it was clear that the select board is more interested in a full-time planner, I don't think that what was budgeted to begin with 35,000 is realistic for a full-time planner and benefits. So I think we need to budget for a lot more than that if that's what is looking for. So, I mean, that's all that they had in there at the time. I think we need to, there was a talk of this for the past couple of years, actually, the planning board giving us a warning that they're not getting any younger. Uh, they feel like, you know, they're going to need at some point because of the uh, prosperous Route 9 and of different things that develop throughout the town. and. I think if we can at least give this amount of time, not planning on them for a uh, spring town meeting, but maybe bring something forward to us in the fall where we could implement it for the following year. So at least have some thought on, give them uh, a time to get some thoughts together to bring this to us for a fall town meeting. 
and maybe implement it in the next budget that's coming up. Yeah, I think it'll be fine for, you know, are you, so are you saying you want to see it in the budget this year, Joyce, or next year? Next year's budget, but I'd like them to bring something to us on how we could implement that or how we could do um, creative and, and, and doing a part-time something maybe in the fall uh, and then having it move forward to a full-time uh, position uh, in the following year. Um, we've got to get somebody in there now to start learning their process. Um, we all don't know exactly what each one does. We have a general idea, uh, and I think that it would behoove us to get somebody on board that at least would participate part-time uh, in knowing what's going on. Okay. I still think we do need a full-time person in that position to really... Yeah be a yeah. professional that is paid to do what needs to get done. And I just feel like that being a priority in the budget and making cuts elsewhere would be preferred given the situation we're in and having somebody looking out for that best interest of the town. But um, that, that's where I stand. Amy, I thought the way I understood it was that 35,000 was supposed to be for uh, part-time shared or uh, through Pioneer Valley planning through a regional thing and then we don't know we got we got off course with that also in discussions well, they also increased their budget uh, by 7500 to the uh, Pioneer planning board too so I think my understanding was that that was the increase there plus the 35. So they have two line items of an increase. Well, and I think we asked David to put in a full-time planner. It's just when he did the initial pass at the budget, when he was trying to make things balance, he put it in for at half time. Yeah, and then we yeah. had the conversation. Yeah, so, maybe they so wouldn't hire until later. We didn't update the actual budget document, but we had the administrative charges from the enterprise funds and we basically the offset difference between 2020 and 2021 we cut that difference in half and that was like hundred and fifty thousand dollars extra in the budget so then with that amount of extra money in the budget kind of from the enterprise fund administrative charges we're able to have enough money for a full-time planner for 2021 but that never got I don't know if that ever got changed in the actual documentation of the budget, but that yeah. was the strategy we were looking at. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a, I just, I, I was thinking it was 59,000. You're saying it was 159,000? Amy, Amy is right. It was, was $59,000 and we were going to use that money to fill out the rest of the uh, planner. That, that, that has really, that picture has really changed yeah. since uh, February 19th. So uh, I just want to stress from, on my opinion, um, that we need to go back to the schools and have a hard conversation with, um, you know, on their, their budget for the rest of the year and what's left over. Uh, you know, we've, we've got buildings that are going to be closed for three months with no students in it. So a lack of, you know, supplies, expendables, things like that, uh, even trash service that's not being used on a you know, daily and weekly basis like it was. So anything we can kind of claw back from that, I think would be a big help. Um, I, I, I would like to see the tax rate itself stay the same number because although if values go up, um, you know, people may pay a little bit more at the same rate. I think that's kind of a, a big, um, kind of a, a mental thing for people seeing that their, their tax rate going up when they're having a hard time. So uh, I do think that, you know, if we have to level fund everybody or make cuts in some, some cases in order to make this work and Hey, if we can, if we can come up with the money to hire a part-time planner while we do this by cutting in other areas, then great. But I, I just don't want to see increases on people. Um, I bet you there's going to be a lot of businesses not opening as it is when this is all over and then to add a tax increase on them. And this is, this is not the year to do it. So. Yeah. Level funding may help us through the next year. Okay. Any All right. So, 
So let me let me continue working over the next 48 hours on on something which I think not only is going to help us immediately, but also strategically helpful um, for the long term. And we'll present it at your next meeting. Amy, I'm happy to sit down and talk with you about the particulars. And uh, we probably want to get a finance management team going on on this issue as well. Sounds good. One of the things I just want to say is uh, one thing we for town meeting, I think our residents would would appreciate if we could show that we have not um, we've cut back our spending. If we could show what we've done um, and how seriously we've taken this. I mean, I it would be a really hard sell to to do much of any spending right now and and tell them, you know, when everybody else is having such a tough time. So. Um, I, I think that if we show we've really um, done a good job on, on keeping control of that spending, it would be a great thing for town meeting. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. Anybody if, else uh, comments on the budget before we move on? Just one last thing is I just want to, I just, you know, thinking a lot about this is, and my own business and different things, is like what can we do to invest now in our future? And just keeping in mind, just making cuts and not spending anything is an investing in the future. So just if we're cutting and we're doing different things, what can we do to be strategic that we're investing in our future and putting our best foot forward for the future? And, you know, I guess I'll just end there is we have a AAA bond rating. We have a lot of really key things that can help us invest in our future. And what are we doing to get there? So that's all. Okay. Uh, David Nixon, administrator's report. All town meeting all the time at this point. Okay. Um, but uh, let me let me grab a couple of things. Um, we've covered a lot of the information that uh, is updated on my report. Uh, I do want to. I do want to commend Tom Quinlan and Didi to, uh, for getting the uh, con uh, regular meetings with the departments on commercial and residential building projects. We had a very long conversation on Tuesday. It was very helpful. There was a lot of information that was shared and coordination is, uh, is, is happening. This is going to be essential as we build our way out of the, uh, the the economic situation that we are in. Uh, so kudos to him. Um, and uh, I find it valuable. And I think the other departments find it valuable and certainly will help uh, avoid confusion and dis, uh, uh, disarray. Just want to say that uh, Mother's Club has got uh, by remote participation candidates night for April 27th. On May 6th, it's the last day to register for elections and online registration is encouraged. www.hadleyma.org. Go to the town clerk's page and there you can find it. Uh, May 16th is annual elections and every other date is on hold until further notice. Any uh, announcements? I have a couple, of course, I can't get by the day. And I thank people for uh, stepping in for me last week. I appreciate that. Um, my tonight, it would be um, Tom Stolarski that passed away, um, lived in North Hadley, raised his family there. Uh, he was a Legion member and also a past uh, commander of the Legion. Um, I've been in a parade with Tom for the last 32 years and he never missed a parade. Um, I don't know if we're having a parade this year, but he uh, surely will be missed and um, condolences to his family. Um, I also want to, um, as John stepped in nicely last week, and uh, we have so many people to thank for this uh, uh, stepping up and working in this COVID um, flu season, flu as they, as they decide, panoramic. Um, we have our people that work in the grocery stores, they sometimes are very over uh, missed. And so aren't people that work in nursing homes besides those that work in the hospital. So there are a lot of people that step up and um, 
take part in keeping safe and keeping distancing and uh, making sure that um, all of our citizens and everybody are kept well stocked. I don't know what people are buying off the shelf these days, but anyway, um, thank you to everybody that has, has been a part of this, our emergency management, our police. Um, yesterday was a great uh, parade by our teachers. Um, they went throughout the town waving and uh, their students were just thrilled to see them yesterday. And while they were doing that, our governor said that, you know, they won't be reconvening back in school this year, but uh, I'm sure everybody's going to make the best of it and do their homework as they should be. Um, so again, let's all make sure that we stay as positive as we can and um, we can beat this epidemic that we're going through. So stay safe, please. And, uh, David Nixon, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Legion did cancel the, the parade for this year, right? We heard that Unified Command, I think. That's what I heard. I, I had not heard that. And I guess you can add to it that the Legion parking lot has been uh, paved and they're all set for whenever they need to reopen as anybody else needs to reopen. We uh, We might still have a... Air Force fly over, even though we're not having a parade because it might be too late to stop the uh, the paperwork in the <laughs> for that thing. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, we're all going to stand out and wait for that to happen for sure. <laughs> we'll find out. Any other announcements? I just had one or just wanted to re Jennifer asked me, we're going to do the reverse uh, 911 call. We'll have to decide on that. But David kind of made this. I just wanted to re reiterate annual town election is May 16th at Hopkins Academy. From 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., uh, all town residents, but especially seniors, are encouraged to vote from their home. Application requests for ballots should be sent to the town clerk, uh, 100 Middle Street, Hadley, Mass, 01035. The last day to register to vote for the May 16th town election is Wednesday, May 6th. You can find additional information at hadleyma.org slash town clerk. And then there's just a quick difference here that is gonna be hard to explain on a call, but um, early voting by mail, there are two options for absentee voting, early voting by mail and absentee voting. Early voting by mail applies to only one election. And in this case, it would be the annual town election. Ballots can only be requested by the voter and all voters are eligible to participate in early voting. You must sign return signed original to the town clerk's office. And then absentee voting is ballot applications can be used for up to one calendar year and a ballot will be sent for each election. So the annual town election, uh, September primary, uh, but you'd need to choose a party for that. And then the presidential election, you can exclude primaries if you wish. Ballots can be requested by a family member and a COVID-19 uh, lockdown is an acceptable reason to request for an absentee ballot, but you must return a signed original to the town clerk's office. Um, and then if you're not able to print out applications, you can send them to the town clerk with your signature requesting an absentee ballot. And then lastly, the Halligley Mothers Club is hosting their annual candidates night on Monday, April 27th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And you can watch that Candidates Night live on Hadley Media, YouTube, or channel 192. Uh, all <laughs> questions for candidates are to be submitted by April 26, 2020 at midnight. So that's what, that's uh, Sunday night. Uh, include position question is directed at, so who, who you wanna direct it at, like the select board, include a clear and concise question, include both the full name and street address. You must be a Hadley resident. Those questions must be submitted to hmothersclub, all one word, at gmail.com. And lastly, thank you to the Hadley Mothers Club for sponsoring the, the Candidates Night and Hadley Media for broadcasting the night. And all this information is available at hadleyma.org. Please sign up for Nixle Alerts, and you can see the daily SIT report there as well. I have a quick question about the ballots, if I may. Okay, go for it. Uh, on the absentee or early voting ballots uh, to be returned to the town clerk, 
I assume they can be hand delivered. I think that's what I read. And if that's the case, how does that how does that actually work? There's a drop box on one of the doors at the town hall, but it says submit payments here. It doesn't say anything about anything any other kind of mail. So I'm wondering if if there's going to be a drop box and if it'll be labeled as such. So um, we've been encouraging people to use the Dropbox for non-payment related uh, documents. So I'll check with the town clerk, uh, Alan, and get back in touch with you. But I'm pretty sure that if you drop off something in the mailbox, uh, it will be received uh, and we'll, we'll, make, uh, we'll make it happen. Yeah. Okay. It just, it just needs needs a sign on the Dropbox as to what can go in there. That's all. Yeah. I think I think on a re reverse nine one one call, we're going to need to you know uh, stress that wherever we're going to have them returned, if not by mail, if directly. Okay. Thanks. Perhaps the fire chief could weigh in on that since he well, knows the town the clerk fire, so well. The fire chief is on a call. I'm actually listening, and so I can answer. There we that. go. The uh, Dropbox can be used for anything, not just payments. I received probably close to probably 50 or 60 applications in the Dropbox. One thing that I do want to clarify is that for absentee voting, it doesn't necessarily have to be by mail. It can be emailed as long as the signature is visible. And it cannot be an electronic signature, so someone would have to print it out, fill it out, scan it back, and send it to me. Good. Okay. Any other announcements? No? We just have to decide who's going to do the reverse 911 call. So I don't know if you want to do that or I uh, told Jennifer I would do it, but if you want to do it, you're more than welcome to. I think my mic has a great radio voice. I What's know. that, Jessica? I think my mic has a great radio voice. There you go. Oh, yeah. You want Mike to do it? Yeah, that's good. The fire chief, he's got a good, more rapport. Oh. Town. I'll make I'll make a motion. The fire chief does the reverse call. All right. So Joyce is on record throwing him under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> he loves me. He doesn't care. He doesn't yeah, have. He's done a good him. job in the past. So <laughs> I'll let him know. Thank you, Jessica. All right. So uh, we'll see everybody on May sixth for the next meeting. And five uh, thirty. Yep. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Have a good, good night. night.